Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much to Dr. Mandran for in the introduction. Uh, so today I'd like to present uh, um, a little title. When I gave the title, I didn't realize actually there was a there is already a couple of uh, articles written about the problem with indices. And I'm, when I'm talking about indices, maybe ma many of you are mathematicians are thinking about the power index or CERTs. No, I'm not talking about the mathematical, uh, mathematical index, the index of power structure, but I'm talking about how we are using indices in, the, in our everyday life. For example, uh, every morning, I think if you hear the news, they're talking about financial index, the Straits Times index, and sometimes you hear about the air pollution index. Okay, and these are all the types of indices that we're using, or consumer price index, um, that we are using every day to try and give some information about what we're doing, or how we should be responding, or how should we should be reacting. So, but uh, there are some problems with these indices, and yet I'd like to do a demonstration of what some of the problems are. So, what are really indices? How can we define them? Well, before I define an index, let's take a look at what an indicator is. An indicator generally is one single quantity, uh, like a value of something that you, you want to look at, like for example, the temperature in this room. And you want to say, is the temperature in this room good for me or not? So you might say, what would be the temperature that I would like? And then compare it to the temperature in this room. So you would say, oh, the temperature in this room is 110% colder than I would like it or it's only 90% of what I would like. So that would be an indicator. But then things might get complicated because you don't only want the temperature in the room, you might want to say, what is the humidity? Um, what is the airflow? Am I getting some? So you start to get more complicated when you start to think about different types of measurements that you want to make. Um, so if we look, example, for here, because I come from the Department of Environment, so I'll speak more about environmental indices, but the problems I'm talking about don't only occur for environmental measures. They occur for all types of measures. And there's substantial literature, especially for any of you who are doing economics and econometrics, a lot of literature being written because people are so concerned about what's happening to their money. Okay, but let's be concerned about what's happening to our environment. Now, a pollution variable would be any measurement. For example, you heard Dr. Saim this morning presenting about uh, the water quality parameters, um, some of the heavy metals, some of the toxic chemicals. So a pollutant variable will be any one of these types of measures. And generally, we want to know what the quality is around us to understand, is it good for us? Is it good quality? Do we need to do something about it? Are there some toxicants, for example, the EDCs that are going to affect our, our health in the future? So many, so many, we are using environmental indices, indices just plural of index, and normally this environmental index is one single number that we get. Um, have I been, any of you heard of the environmental pollution index? No, maybe in the news, we might be hearing it quite soon when we get the smoggy or hazy environment and then the news will be saying, oh, the environmental pollution index is high, low, it's good, or stay at home, you know, um, you know avoid exercising because you might be breathing too much of the polluted air. Well, the index is a single number, but it's based on measuring many different parameters. And normally, we, it's so uh, good for us because we say, oh, I don't need to think or analyze about all these different numbers. I only need to look at the single number. So it, it's very useful in that sense. But before we can create the index, we need to do some calculation. And normally, most of these calculations try to compile the information. Yeah? And we like these indicators and indices because it reduces a lot of data into a single number. And it's very good or useful for telling general public because the general public may not understand completely all the different effects that all the different measurements that we make will have on them. Try thinking of how you would explain to your mother or your little brother or your father what research you are doing. How can you explain to them all the technicalities? You try to simplify it. So that's the whole purpose of an index is to try and simplify things. And in the end, we just get, oh, do this, don't do that. It's good for you, it's bad for you. Okay, in, in a single value. Um, of course, the people use it for uh, making policy. Uh, it facilitates communication with the public, but we can use it for all sorts of other things. You know, like here we have standards, allocation, we can do trends, we can give public information. And people do use it for scientific research as well, because they try to look at what are the, the changes in the indices. Um, but 
what is happening in the world now? What is the global re uh, relevance and current status of disease? If we take a look, there are many recent scientific and, publica uh, and technical publications in disease. People are interested in, in indicators, indices, matrices. We heard earlier about the PCA and the principal components and the vectors. And these are all, in a sense, trying to reduce a massive amount of data into a single factor. Okay? Um, but of course, those of you who are doing this work also understand the difficulty in trying to interpret the results of many of the statistical analysis. And there are so many journals that you can publish this information. There's even a society for mind control indices. And people start to talk about what definitions there are and what are the different types of indicators that you have or indices, depending on how you're doing the calculation. In fact, for envir environmental performance, there's a standard under ISO 14031. It's called Environmental Performance Indicators. And they are looking at environmental performance of organizations. Um, our university, University Putra Malaysia, is trying to get um, a certification for 14001, which is Environmental Management System. And inside there, they need to have some benchmarks, and they're using indicators or indices for their benchmarking. In fact, if we look in Scopus and Science Direct, Google Scholar, there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of papers relating to environmental performance evaluation only. We don't even talk about the different biological indicators, biodiversity, uh, health indicators, happiness index, I know GDP. These are all trying to uh, make the massive amount of data into a single value which can be interpreted or try to be interpreted. Uh, in fact, people talk about how uh, can we link the index to uh, things which are forcing the environment. Uh, if we have a driver, we want to do development, there's a response in the environment, there's an impact, how can we measure this type of things? And so people try to classify indicators into, let's say, what's happening to the environment? Does it matter? Is it important for us? Are we improving or are we better off than what we are before? So, but some people, there are so many different discussions, some people are against the use of indices altogether because they say that it's too difficult how can I tell you in one word or in one number everything that is happening? Or try to uh, make you understand the complexity of the work that I'm doing or the research or the interactions. But some people say, oh no, you know, I I'm not really interested in all the very details. I only want to know what should I do? Just tell me, is it good? Uh, should I take care? Should I stay at home? Should I go out? What's the air quality like? Uh, I don't understand if you're telling me suspended sediment, you know, sulfur dioxide, what the effect will be on my lungs. No, I just want to know what I should do. So there is a big argument, pros and cons of using indices. Um, the people say the raw data is the best in order to understand what's happening. And other people say, no, it's too complex. I don't understand. I don't want to know. Just tell me what I should do. Okay. So if we do do indices, we must accept that we are removing a lot of information. Yeah, I just imagine 10,000 data into one. What's happening is 10,000 that gives us only one value. Can this one value explain what these 10,000 pieces of data are telling us? Uh, I hope as scientists you will start to think about in your work when you start even doing means or standard deviation, what actually does it tell you? And I'm sure you realize that uh, you need more numbers. Mean doesn't really tell you what the population is like. Standard deviation gives you a better idea, but it doesn't really tell you whether it's skewed or not. Okay? So there are many advances in environmental and sustainability indicators now. And in the next uh, 15 years, the United Nations have said that you know, we should be looking at development and sustainability, sustainable development. And because of that, there's a large push, even trying to see what is the progress in sustainability. In fact, in the last 20 years, a uh, you know, review paper by Shebinin said, well, there's so many indicators now. There are more than 11 different types of indicators which people are proposing just to measure whether something's sustainable or not. Um, but he says that actually we need to look seriously at these methods, the statistical methods, how we do the calculation, even how we're looking at the footprint. Yeah, there's so many different reporters, and they're all very different, and are they really telling us what's happening uh, in the world? So how do we calculate index? Let's just go through something very simple. Uh, indexes in the environment are normally a pollution index or a quality index. So if it's a pollution index, it's normally air pollution. Normally, air indexes are pollution. 
the index increases with in increasing pollution. If it's a quality index, normally the index increases with increasing quality. So these indices are, you know, they're, they're let's say, one over the other. They're very different. Um, normally, if we talk about water, we're talking about water quality because people want good quality. But if it's air, people talk about, oh, how the air pollution might affect me. Yeah. But most of the mathematical structures uh, involve trying to get smaller data into one number. So they normally they, you start off with indicators, measurements of single type of values, single parameters, single changes, and try to lump them all together. And we have many combinations that we can have or aggregation, how we can combine this data to become one value. Normally, most of it, you have to look at a single value and see, okay, how important is this? And how does it represent what the impact will be? And let's try and add it up, okay? And we can have many different types of ways of adding them up. We can sum them up, we can multiply it. And something, sometimes people just say, oh, that's too complicated. Let's just say what the maximum value is. And in Malaysia, for the air pollution index, for the air pollution index, which is based I think, on five measurements, five different measurements, they just look, what is the highest? And we'll report that. We'll tell you what the highest is. Okay? So that's the air pollution index. But the water quality index is much more complicated. Now, air, the water quality index in Malaysia uh, tries to look at linear functions. We assume the effect of uh, water quality has some linear or curvilinear effect on health, okay, or on the quality of the water. And it's very easy to calculate or simple to understand, especially for straight lines. Um, you know, there are different types of linear functions, negative effects, positive effects. You can have curvilinear, segmented, linear function, just add different lines on, depending on how we think the effect is changing over time. Um, we can do stepped, uh, you know, uh, below this step, it's okay. Above this step, it's not okay. And the effect might be, you know, like for example, we're saying for the EDCs, when you drink water, you're taking Panadol, okay? Uh, imagine what the dosage would be for Panadol. Normal Panadol, you only take two Panadol. If you start taking eight Panadol, you get very, very ill. Not get well, get very ill. If you take 20 Panadol, you're probably knocked out. But if you take 30 Panadol, you'll still be knocked out. Okay, so you can have things which are these types of administrative index where, okay, I can take up to here and then I charge you. You're going too fast, I'm going to fine you. You know, all the traffic cops waiting to catch you. But after that, you can go as fast as you like, I'm still going to fine you. So sometimes people think, well, if I'm going to go over the speed limit, I might as well go as fast as I can over the speed limit because the fines will be the same. Okay, so you can get these different types of structures of indices. I'll take, let's take a look at the Malaysian Water Quality Index, which is from the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been developed in 1981. It has six parameters. They are nonlinear sub-indices. They're aggregated by a weighted sum. What does that mean? That when they start adding them up, they said some parameters are more important than others. I will weight them. I will make them more important, okay? So here is the index quality IJAS, which is the water quality index of the Department of Environment. And they are based on certain parameters like the biological oxygen demand, which measures the amount of organic matter inside the water, the chemical oxygen demand, which measures the chemical pollution in the water, and they do have like ammonia, you heard about ammonia earlier, and suspended sediment also measures the pH neutrality of the water. So the water quality index in Malaysia has these different parameters, it has these different weights, and you can see the most important factor, the 0.22 proportion for the total calculation, is the dissolved oxygen. The more air the water has, the better it is, because things can live in it, and the oxygen is well aerated. And then you have the biological, the organic, the chemical. And this ammonia is the waste, normally human or animal waste, suspended sediment, and the neutrality of the water. Okay, you don't, well, I'm not gonna test you on this equation later, okay? But what I would like to show you is an example of a study, of a small study, which is done by one of my undergraduate students, and it got very interesting results because we wanted to ask, okay, is the water quality index really telling us, is this single figure really telling us about the pollution in our waters? How can we compare it to what we can imagine would be the pollutants in the water? So the simple study was, let's take a look at the relationship between the water quality index and the total mass of pollutants in the water. So we can estimate the total mass of pollutants in the water by looking at the concentration multiplied by the volume of the 
concentration. So we just get a simple mass, a simple calculation. Concentration is mass divided by volume. Discharge is volume per unit time. How many meter cues of water is flowing in the river? And we just multiply these two together and we get the mass. So let's try and see whether the water quality index, which is just based on the calculation, is an agglomeration of many factors together trying to indicate what the quality is. How does that compare with the mass of pollutants in the water? Here are the results for single rivers in the different states in Malaysia. And he's calculated the water quality index and looked at uh, average from, okay, from 2009 to 2013. And the Department of Environment tends to measure uh, monthly or every two months in these rivers. And he looked at the station where there was water quality measurement as well as nearby a uh, discharge measurement, a flow measurement, so that he could do the calculation. So here we see in the different um, states, um, the minimum value for the WQI up to the maximum value of the WQI and the average value. And we can compare that with the total pollution load, which he also got by using the same data uh, as well as the data flow. And we can see very clearly here, oh, they look a little bit different. The one before looks almost uniformly the water quality index of these rivers almost about the same, not much different. Okay, 100 here uh, it's, it's going, is a water quality index here, but in this case, these are not so good quality. There's a, you know, in a moderate quality. And here we're looking at the pollution load, of course, loads of pollution here, there's a log scale. Um, you can see we're trying to, uh, you know, when the measurement is really affected by the total amount of water flowing, but you can see there's a very diff a big difference here between these two states. And for those who know, the states in Malaysia, Kelantan is a very rural, uh, how to say, a, among one of the least developed states. It's mainly agriculture based. But surprise, surprise, the amount of pollution is much, much higher than many of the so called slime developed states. It's very strange. Why is that? Well, Kelantan has a very large discharge. So even you have a small concentration with a large discharge, as a very high mass, high amount of pollutants going through. Okay, then we have these values. What do they look like? What is the relationship between the pollution load and WQI? Does the WQI reflect the pollution load? Well, we have one value here from Klantan. And then slowly he started putting together all the other states. And in the end, we got all of this. Wow, he said, what does this really tell us? Well, in essence, uh, he was saying, should I need to interpret each one? I said, well, no, Let, let's look. What do you see? Are they all the same? I said, no, it's, they're all different, all over the place. You can see for each of the states, the WQI, the Water Quality Index, which has been calculated concentration, have different relationships with the pollution load. And they're not even close together. They're just totally different. So this brings up the, the point that if I have Water Quality Index in one state, can I even compare it with the Water Quality Index in another state? Well, really, no. It seems to be quite different, and the relationship, you know, uh, varies. Some has quite a quite a steep gradient. Some has much uh, shallower gradient. In fact, if you look here, even the R squares are quite different because the data, the spread in the data is quite significant. And one of the reasons is because the concentration and the discharge are acting somewhat independently. They're not really related. So you can have a high discharge and low concentration, or a high concentration and a high discharge, or a low concentration and a low discharge. <coughs> And they're all over the place when you cal start calculating the mass. But when you do the water quality index, they all look about the same. Okay, so this brings us some of the questions actually we started to ask is which would be better? Well, it's not really clear which would be better. Concentration has, is important because there is an effect of toxicity. And toxicity is dependent on the concentration, on the dosage. So for example, you could be taking two Panadol every day, but if you do it every day, in 30 days, you'll be taking 60 pills of Panadol. Or you could be just taking two Panadol once in a month, and your total load of Panadol will just be two, and you still get an effect. But maybe over time, you get acclimatized to, or you get used to the Panadol, and the two Panadol doesn't work for you anymore. Okay, so the effects might be very different. So essentially here, there are some concerns about the uses of indices. Uh, their definition, methodology, the validation of the metrics is different for different things. Sometimes people use indices for performance or for org organizational indicators or benchmark. Uh, UPN, for example, is using a lot of benchmarking or KPI, key performance indicators, 
what actually are they telling us? Are they related to totals? They're related to rates? Uh, are they actually uh, indicating what we would like them to indicate or we think that they're indicating? And nowadays, people are looking at life cycle assessment for environmental products in order to see the holistic effect through the whole chain. And so they're using models and footprints. They, you know, you have the carbon footprint, the water footprint, the ecological footprint. But these numbers, no matter what they do, they're all trying to bring a whole mass of data into one number. Okay? So the scope of environmental indicators may broaden. Pe more people may start to use them because people want to get a simple answer to a very complex question. Um, but you have these issues, like I said, is the frequency of adverse conditions taken into account? How about the degree of severity? How bad is bad? Okay, so these are some of the issues we have when we're trying to construct indices. And there's a ranking paradox. For example, in location A, you can have something bad conditions happen frequently, but at a low level. Whereas in location B, you might have bad conditions very severe, but only once in a while. Which one is worse? Okay. We, we may still not know, we still need to do quite a bit of research then. And in summary, I would like to uh, bring you the conclusions which actually came from this paper, The Problem with Indices, same title that I gave, which I didn't know at the time. And this came from the Marine Pollution Bulletin. And this article was written as a result of uh, the two authors attending a conference where a student was presenting their work on the use and of developing in indices for measuring environmental or marine pollution. And they said that really there's so many problems, but people are still using it. The thing is that they said that we are researchers. Should we be advocating the use of these indices? We understand the complexities. When we give a single number, we are giving it for people because we think that people don't understand. But by making that number, we create that lack of knowledge. We continue or we support the lack of knowledge in society. We don't try to make them understand. We tell, we say, it's good enough to just give them one number. Don't make it complicated for them, you know. Whereas the, our purpose as knowledge workers or researchers is trying to educate public. He says, using, uh, avoid using indices because of information loss. And because they use, can lead to some misleading con conclusions. For example, as I said, like the water quality index in Malaysia. If you must use it for some nine scientific reason, for example, you know, because you've got a calculator, it's so easy now, you can go to any website, they can do simple calculations for you, you can just plug in the numbers. Use them, they say, with other methods. So you can give one number, but other numbers come up, you know. Uh, especially, for example, when people talking about biodiversity. A single number trying to indicate to you what is happening in an ecosystem. And you get the same number, it doesn't matter what type of ecosystem it is or what function that ecosystem uh, serves in, in the environment. So developing simplistic numbers uh, simply to satisfy the least knowledgeable scientists and managers is hardly the best way to advance either scientific <coughs> knowledge or management decision making. So at the moment, I see there's a lot of research possibility in looking to how to, let's say, if we want to make an index, how can we make an index which would more accurately portray or give an idea of what is happening? You can see the question that I raised just about the water quality index and the pollution load. The pollution load itself is a single value. It doesn't tell you what the variation is in the pollution load over the year or over 10 years. Is it increasing or not? It's just a single number. So we, as I think, as researchers or scientists, do have a duty. We can use the, ind the index to first give some information, but we need to educate society more so that they can understand actually what is the usefulness of this number. You know, we need to give some description because people are getting more educated. You know? And so they, there is a growing understanding. There's a whole wealth of knowledge. Uh, it's just to make sure that we don't give them the wrong knowledge. Okay, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much.